Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Can everybody see that presentation? I just want to make sure. Um, I can't see anything. I don't know. Yeah, I don't see anything yet either. Pull up. Uh, oh, I didn't click share. Yeah, that'll do it. Okay, okay I can see it. <laughs> okay, perfect. Okay, so as you may have guessed from the title, this presentation is about how to be a great speaker in PF and just a great speaker in general. So I'm going to go, first of all, like as a quick little roadmap for all of you guys, I'm going to go first of all over talking about myself and a little bit of my qualifications, introducing myself and stuff like that. And then I'm going to be going over some basics of PF in case you guys like don't have an understanding of that yet. Just the structure, what the speeches are for, just for like 10 minutes or so, just so everybody has an understanding of what the speeches are about. Uh, then I'm just going to go over some general speaking tips. Um, then I'm going to talk about some preparation and practice you can do before the rounds. And then what you can do during the rounds, tactically, strategically, talking to your judge uh, to make you the best speaker that you can possibly be. All right. So get started. So just a little bit about me. Um, I have done PF for three years, ever since my sophomore year. I just graduated this year. And um, I've been to national tournaments. I've competed at Emory uh, in Atlanta. I've competed at Isidore Newman in New Orleans. And I've broken at Emory with my partner in Laika John. Very good. Uh, I also qualified for nationals uh, after my junior year, not in PF, but in world schools, uh, which I know Anna, Dean, and Trey went to nationals in world schools this year. Uh, and yeah, that's about it. So. First of all, we're gonna go into some basics of PF, which is just like gonna be a quick overview so that everybody can get oriented with the style in case not everybody's familiar necessarily with what public forum is. So um, first of all, we have the constructive. And so as you can see with my little graphic there, it's basically just building the foundation of your speech. You're kind of just, it's an introduction to your arguments and your contentions. You establish your framework, your impact, and what you want the judge to vote for at the end of the round. You're just building the foundation for the round. These should be the base arguments that you want to build the round up off of. Um, and then you have the, there are two rebuttals. The first rebuttal is a little bit different than the second rebuttal, just because of the different arguments that you have to address. So in the first rebuttal, it's just basically to rebut the opponent's arguments, because um, if you're in the first rebuttal, this other rebuttal hasn't happened yet. So nobody's brought any arguments against your case. So it's basically four minutes of you ideally talking about your opponent's case and why those arguments don't stand in the round. And there are a few ways you can do that. You can go line by line, which is essentially, uh, if you have, if an argument has a claim, a link, which is how the impact happens, and an impact, then you can refute the claim because of these three reasons, refute the link because of these three reasons, and refute the impact of these three reasons. And you also want to expand on the arguments made in your constructive, because again, the opponent has not yet given the rebuttal, so there's no really need to defend your arguments against anything, but just to make them stick in the judge's mind, just to go back over the impacts really quickly and make sure that the judge has a full understanding of what you're talking about with your arguments and make sure that the impacts of those arguments really stick in your judge's head. And then the second rebuttal is a little bit more difficult than the first rebuttal because you both have to refute your opponent's case and answer arguments made against your own case. And you can use that same style of line by line reputation or just kind of do a general reputation against the contention. And time management is a lot more important in this speech because again, the first rebuttal has basically four minutes to read arguments against your case, whereas you have four minutes to read arguments against their case and also answer the arguments that have been brought against your case. And so basically there's kind of like a recommended split that you should do here. Uh, most people try to go for two minutes and 30 seconds answering their opponent's case and a minute and a half uh, addressing their own case. But as long as you, manage to fit everything in, as long as you're kind of within that range, it's going to be a good speech and you're going to be organized and be able to manage your time. And again, you need to prioritize in the speech. Anything that kind of slips through the cracks can be uh, cleaned up in the summary. So it's just the most important thing you can do is address the arguments that are going to win or lose you the round. Um, and then we have cross X and cross X happens uh, after the first two constructives the first two rebuttals and the first two, the, not the first two, the two rebuttals, the two summaries and the two constructives. And so the purpose of cross -ex is basically to just get clarification on arguments you don't understand or don't think hold up well. 
in layman's terms, it just counts, they just sound kind of sketchy. They're too good to be true. You hear it and you're like, there's no way that can be true. Like if somebody has an impact that everybody in the world dies because like, for example, using the September and October topic, like on balance, charter schools are beneficial to US education. And the argument is that the existence of charter schools is direct threat to the existence of humanity or something like that. And you're like, there's no way that's true. Cross-sex is a way to ask questions about that and find out where the cracks in that argument are, where it's not necessarily true, where it doesn't necessarily make sense. And along with that, you, uh, an underrated purpose of cross-sex is to clarify or explain arguments of your own that your opponent or judge might not understand. It's really, really important to make sure that the round isn't muddled and to make sure that everybody's on the same page. And while that might seem like on a base level, like an advantage, like your opponents don't understand your arguments or something, and you're like, yeah, cool, let's roll with that. If they don't understand your arguments, then it's just gonna make it really confusing for the judge to understand what both sides are talking about. It's gonna make it really confusing for them to weigh both impacts if you're talking about two completely different things. And so you wanna make it as easy as possible for the judge to, um, to judge the round, to weigh your impacts, to compare the two sides. And so in CrossFX, you wanna answer questions about your own arguments like in a forthcoming manner, uh, saying it like taking a, taking a chance to explain everything that's going on in your case. Okay, and then we have the first summary. Uh, and this is a three minute speech. CrossX is three minutes as well. I don't know if I mentioned that. It was actually two minutes uh, for the first two years that I did PF and they expanded it to three minutes last year, which is really nice. It gives you a lot more time to get through everything. And so this is a speech where the rounds should start condensing to the most important arguments, only the arguments that are gonna win or lose you the round. I've got my little funnel up there. And so that's kind of what it should be like. Like you have all the arguments that have been made in the round and then there's this funnel, it comes in and it narrows down and out come only the most important arguments, only the arguments that have been dropped, only the arguments that maybe you haven't addressed so far or addressed adequately, and only the arguments that again, you think are gonna win or lose you the round. Uh, it's basically just narrowing the scope of the debate. Ask yourself, what are the arguments that my opponents haven't answered? What are the arguments maybe we haven't answered adequately or have really devastating impacts that could lose us the rounds? And that should be pretty much all you address in the summary. And in the first summary, you also have to deal with the rebuttals your opponent put against your case, because if you're the first speaker, you wouldn't have had a chance to address those rebuttals. And you also need to extend the rebuttals made by your rebuttal speaker against your opponent's case. And finally, to weigh impacts. And so weighing impacts is kind of think of it like a scale, basically. So you have two impacts, you got these two little scale thingies. And so you're trying to do a side-by-side -side comparison of your impacts and tell the judge which impact is more important and for what reason. And so there are three basic reasons that um, you can say that your impact is more important than your opponent's. First of all is time frame, uh, second is magnitude, and third is scope. Time frame is kind of self-explanatory. It's basically saying, okay, my impacts will happen more quickly than my opponent's, they'll happen like sooner. So we need to do a better job of addressing them right now because there are more pressing issues. Magnitude is basically how, uh, like how damaging it, it is to an individual person. So like you could say like, for example, uh, like having like getting a paper cut versus dying. Like obviously if somebody's impacted getting a paper cut and yours is dying, then yours affects that person more severely. So you have better magnitude. And then scope is just in general, how many people it affects. So like using the paper cut versus death example, like you could say 7 billion people are gonna get a paper cut, but only two, 2 million people are gonna die. So in that case, the paper cut person has the advantage in scope. And then there's the second summary. And so this is basically kind of the same speech as the first summary. It's to continue condensing the rounds, go through what you have left standing, what they don't, and you really need to hammer on that. Make sure your judge understands what you've answered in their case and why that matters in the rounds. And then again, talk about what arguments that haven't been refuted on your side matter more than those on your opponent's side. And that's just going back to weighing impacts. And finally, we have the final focus. This is a two minute speech. And again, you've got the little scales over there. And so it's to explain to the judge why you won the round. Basically, that's all it is. It's a biased RFD in favor of your side. Ideally, think about the speech starting like, we've won this round because, and then go through all the reasons that you've won the round. Think about, like, think of yourself as the judge writing an RFD after the round. And basically, you're saying, okay, my, my side, your side, won this, won this round because they won this impact. Uh, my opponent didn't address this, something like that. And so think of yourself as telling the judge how to write that RFD, telling the judge why you won the round. 
And again, in the final focus, it's often a place to address your impacts and your opponent's impacts in a more clear and impactful way than in prior speeches. Whereas constructives and rebuttals and summaries are a little bit more focused on refutation and a little bit more focused on the links and the claims, final focuses are a place for rhetoric and really using your passion, uh, the power you can put in your voice and varying your volume and tone and speed to make your impact seem as impactful as possible to the judge. Okay. Uh, does anybody have any questions about the basic structure of a round? Anything they want to know? Uh, right. I wanted to, I wanted to like kind of emphasize on how you as a PFR, so like Anna and I have talked a lot about cross X in like a policy sense. So like how is like PF like significantly different or like how do you attack PF from a PF or cross X from a PF standpoint? Yeah, for sure. Okay. So, um, Basically, I know that policies cross X is just one person asking another person questions and it happens after each speech. And so in PF, it happens after the first, after the two constructives, after the two rebuttals, after the two summaries. And so basically in PF, it's kind of like a back and forth thing where generally like it's considered like etiquette that the first speaker in the round gets the first question. And then they ask a question to the opponent, the opponent answers the question and then the opponent gets to ask the question. And so obviously time management is a lot more important in cross X and PF as opposed to policy because it's both shorter and because uh, two people are trying to ask questions and two people are trying to answer questions. And so it's really important to communicate with your partner about the things that they might not understand and that they need to understand in the rebut for to give a, an effective rebuttal speech. And it's also really important to think about what only are the most pressing issues in the round, only the things that can lose you the round. Because again, you don't really have much time, and especially if your opponent kind of gets long-winded on answers and starts rambling, you can try to cut them off, but it's not necessarily always uh, effective, but yeah. Um, and you also, again, like just regarding cross X, like don't be rude, don't just try to ask questions over somebody else, like respect the etiquette of cross X and respect the, uh, like, the fact that people are, the other, the opponent is supposed to ask questions as well. Okay. Uh, awesome. Wait, I have a question. You, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. You might get to this in a little bit, but I was wondering if there's like a strategy for like the speaker positions. Is it just like who writes the neg case is the second negative speaker, or like how does that work? Um. Yeah, that's pretty much how it always works in PF. It's just like whoever makes the the case is the second speaker, and okay. whoever doesn't make it is the first speaker. And I was actually going to talk about like the importance of communicating and understanding your partner's case because you're still going to have to debate it and the summary is probably the most important speech in the rounds in terms of condensing and that's when you really need to be able to give clear and concise explanations of your uh, of your case and of your arguments and because if you're the summary speaker that means that you didn't write that case it's very very important to have conversations with your partner have conversations with varsity members on your team have conversations with your coach that ensures that you understand both the resolution and the uh, the arguments that you're making in your case Okay, anything else? All right, awesome. Uh, so now I'm just gonna talk about some general speaking tips that might be helpful for anybody who wants to be a good speaker. And so before I get into this, speaking isn't just like going into a round and being a good speaker. It's about half what you do before the round and half what you do in the round. I can't overstate the importance of practice and preparation in terms of being a good speaker because you can be a really talented speaker right now as a novice, as a JV, but if you don't practice and if you don't work to get better at speaking and if you don't work to do things like eliminate nonverbals, eliminate verbal fillers, then what's gonna happen is that there are gonna be other people that are working harder than you and there are gonna be people that surpass you as a speaker and then you're not gonna be that good of a speaker anymore. And again, it's all about practice, all about preparation, all about putting the hard work in to be a good speaker. It's half just being able to talk in front of people and half practicing and preparing for your speeches. Okay, and so the goal of all speeches, at least in terms of PF, is to convince the judge that the arguments you're making are valid and impactful. So in terms of the categories that I'm about to go through, talking about what makes a good speaker, you need to view it all through the lens of convincing the judge the arguments that you're making are valid, by which I mean the judge understands and remembers those arguments at the end of the round, and impactful, which is that they stick in his or her head and voting against you is the absolute worst thing that they can do. And so in terms of like making sure that your arguments are understood 
and making sure that your arguments are, under, are remembered. It's really important to have good organization and good time management in your speeches because otherwise you're gonna be skipping around a lot. You're gonna be talking more quickly than you want to and the judge maybe isn't gonna be able to get some of those arguments down in his or her flow. And in terms of impact, you need to speak with passion. Uh, you need to vary your tone, vary your volume, vary your speed uh, and be clear, uh, enunciate your words uh, to make sure that your judge, the impacts of those arguments really stick in their brain. Okay. Um, and so one quick thing again, before we get into this is that you need to embrace your style. And so I was partnered with Malika John, who's the captain at BHS last year for three years in PS. And naturally we're like really different debaters. Malika is more calm and reserved and um, not necessarily quiet, but more measured. And whereas like, I'm just like naturally like louder uh, and more passionate and stuff like that. And so like, that doesn't mean that either of us are better debaters than the other. Like we both won a lot of speaker awards. We've both had a lot of success in debate at national competitions and stuff like that. And so if you're louder and more passionate, that's great. And you should continue to speak like that. You should continue to use your passion and your natural feel for like the volume of the room and stuff like that to convince your judges that your arguments are impactful. But if you're calmer, if you're quieter, if you're a little more reserved, that's totally okay too. You're, you can be just as good of a speaker as somebody who might seem like more domineering, more confident in the round. It's really important to, to embrace your own speaking style. And as long as you really try to be organized, as long as you manage your time, and as long as you're not speaking too slowly or too quickly, as long as you're not speaking too softly or too loudly, um, you're gonna be good. There's kind of like a pretty big uh, spectrum of variation that you can have in terms of your volume, of your tone, of your speed. And as long as you kind of fall within the sweet spot, it's gonna be okay. So don't worry about it if you're softer than somebody else. Don't worry about it if you're louder than somebody else. You just need to embrace your own speaking style and be the best speaker that you can possibly be. Okay, and so just like a quick mantra that I want you guys to like remember. And this is what uh, in my senior year, I would like write this down on my paper before every speech. I would repeat it to myself in my head. Uh, you need to be calm, collected, and confident. Calm because there are going to be times when you don't know how to answer something like in a round. The, the opponent's going to have a really good argument and you're going to say, oh my God, like, what do I do about that? But it's important to not freak out and remember everything that you have going for you. Do your best to answer it and move on. And remember all the arguments that maybe they've dropped. Remember all the good answers that you've brought against their case. Remember all the devastating, like super solid impact that you know you have. Because something that really trips people up and makes them look less confident and makes them look like worse speakers is when they clearly don't know how to answer something. And they're clearly losing their cool as they're giving a speech. Because like basically what will happen, and I found myself doing this um, a few times definitely, is that if, you, if, it's, if you're not calm and you don't know how to answer something, you're gonna keep going back over it. And it's gonna be obvious to the judge and to your opponents that you're floundering and that you don't really know what to say against it. And so your judge is gonna take that into account and it's gonna become a, a more important issue in their minds and the opponent's probably gonna see it and the opponent's gonna say, okay, this is something that my opponent clearly doesn't know how to answer. And so I'm gonna really, really bring that up in the next few rounds in cross et etc. So it's really important to be calm, do your best to answer arguments, do your best to answer refutation, and then move on, get to the stuff that you know is really, really good. And again, you just need to trust your partner, you need to just trust your arguments and trust yourself to win the round, trust yourself to be the best speaker that you can possibly be. And along with that, uh, you have to, you, if you get nervous, it's completely okay. Like I still get nervous before every single debate round that I've ever had. And I've been doing it for three years. It just happens, it's gonna keep happening. And it might, it's probably gonna get not as bad as it is when you're a novice, but it's still gonna happen. And so just remember that if you're nervous, it can lead to you talking a little bit quicker, it can lead to slip ups, it can lead to addressing stuff that you might not, uh, or not addressing things that you needed to address. So just remember that you're a good debater, Remember that you are a good speaker and remember all the stuff that you have going for you. And in terms of being collected, you need to be organized. You need to know where you're gonna start, where you're gonna end and how you're gonna get from your intro to conclusion. It's really important to signpost in your speech, which is basically telling the judge where you're going in your speech. So you can say, after you've addressed one of the opponent's arguments, you can say, okay, judge, and now I'm moving on to their second contention. Now I'm moving on to this claim or this impact. Uh, and then you can also road, do a roadmap for the speech, which is saying, telling your judge where you're going before the speech even starts, saying, okay, judge, I'm gonna start 
with their first contention, move to their second contention, and then I'm gonna go back to my case and address my first contention, and then my second contention. Being collected is really, really important because if you have a general understanding of where you want to go in a speech, if you have a general understanding of what you want to say, uh, then you're gonna be a really good speaker because you're gonna be able to transition smoothly. You're gonna be able to explain your ideas smoothly without having to look down at your paper as much. And if you're organized, then it's just gonna make it all the more easier for the judge to understand and remember what you're saying. And so it's okay to like write details and little facts and figures on your computer and on your flow paper, but uh, as long as you try to keep eye contact with the judge, as long as you have a general idea of what you're talking about, then you're gonna be a good speaker. And finally, confidence. And I know Somia gave a speech about this last night, I think, talking about, or maybe she was going to. Uh, yeah, like she wrote a blog post, confidence. but yeah. All right, awesome, yeah, 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 there you go. <laughs> so like, check that out for sure. Like confidence is something that starts mentally and confidence is something that's really, really important. Because if you're not confident, you're not gonna be a good speaker. You can have the best argument in the world, like you know it's 100% true, there's nothing that can refute it, but if you don't deliver it confidently, and if you don't believe in that argument, your judge, is gonna say, your judge isn't gonna think it's that good. Your judge isn't gonna think it's as impactful as it actually is. Because if you don't give it that confident delivery that it deserves, then it's not gonna be, it's not gonna stick in the judge's mind as well as it would have if you really delivered it with passion and with confidence. And so this really starts before the round with gathering evidence with creating good arguments, with having practice rounds and giving practice speeches. If you do a lot of that stuff, and if you trust in your arguments, and if you are open to honest critiques from varsity members, from your coach, then you're gonna gain confidence and you're gonna be a really good speaker. Okay, so there are like six kind of main categories that I would say make a good speaker, or that you need to be mindful of when you're speaking to ensure that you're communicating your ideas to the judge in the best way possible. Uh, the first is speed. And so the thing to remember with speed is that you need to find the, speed, the sweet spot. Don't speak too quickly, but don't speak too slowly. Um, if you speak too slowly, it kind of like, it looks listless. It looks like uh, apathetic. It doesn't look like you care about what you're saying that much. Uh, and also it can be kind of abrasive to the judge. Like the judge, if you talk in one slow tone the whole time, or even if you talk in one quick tone the whole time, the judge will be like, it'll stop paying attention. They'll start thinking about other things. If you, if, you, if you speak in a monotone speed the whole time, then it's gonna look to the judge like you don't really care about what you're saying. And it's also gonna be difficult for them to pay attention. Whereas if you vary your speed uh, and you slow down on the important points and make sure that your judge gets them, it's gonna look a lot more impactful and it's gonna allow your judge to remember those arguments all the better. And so like the way I think about this is like, um, you're gonna wanna slow down on again, the rhetoric that you're bringing to the rounds and also important facts and figures. So if you had, uh, for example, a rock solid statistic that said that if, uh, using one of like the past topics, if the United States removes sanctions against Venezuela, um, 7 million people are gonna be out of hunger in two years. And so you have that in your case, right? And so you wanna really impress upon that statistic because that's a lot of people. 7 million people out of hunger is a really big thing. And so you'd slow down and say, judge, 7 million people are going to be out of hunger by the year 2020 if the United States removes sanctions against Venezuela. And so again, slowing down, injecting passion into your voice uh, and making sure that the judge really, really gets those points is really important. And along, a lot about finding the sweet spot uh, is, and speaking at a good pace comes with practice. Like it's really just about having a feel for how quickly you talk and how you need to adjust that maybe in rounds to uh, allow your judge to best understand and remember your impacts. And so it's really all about practice and it's all about being uh, honest with yourself about how fast you talk. And if something keeps coming up, like if critiques keep being given to you that say, hey, maybe you talk a little bit quickly. And then if you get that in one round, you get it in another round, get it in another round, then you're gonna start saying, okay, maybe I need to slow down. And so a good rule of thumb, just in general for novices is to speak a little faster than a normal conversational tone when you're practicing, like just up that speed just a little bit, because again, you don't have that much time really to get through all the arguments that you need to get through. And in rounds, remember to slow down. Because something that I've noticed is that in practice rounds, I am aware that I need to talk a little bit more quickly than normal. But in rounds, I start overdoing that. And I start getting nervous. And then I start talking really, really quickly. And in policy, speed is really good. Like if you're a fast speaker in policy, then that's like, a okay, great for you. 
but in PF, it's really, really not something, especially in Arkansas, that people are going to be cool with. Like, I've had judges, and I, uh, I'm like a little bit more of a quicker speaker than most people. Like, I think it's just some, my, my normal cadence. I have like a little bit of a quicker tone than other people. And so judges have told me like time and time again that, hey, you need to slow down. And it's a really, really big thing for a lot of judges in Arkansas. Like speed is their major hangup. They do not like it if you talk quickly. And obviously they shouldn't because if they can't understand what you're saying and or like they can't write it down, then they're not going to be able to remember it at the end of the rounds. They're not going to be able to weigh it in the rounds. And then they're not going to be able to give an accurate picture of what happened in the rounds in their RFD. They're not going to be able to vote for the right size necessarily. And so like, important to remember to slow down, important to remember to have a conversational tone, to not speak too quickly, but also try not to speak too slowly. Again, a lot of that comes with practice. But even if you are in that sweet spot, sweet spot there are going to be times where things just happen that are out of the ordinary, or things happen where maybe you just speed up for one round because, I don't know, you just are out of rhythm, something like that. And then it's like, that's completely okay. There are going to be rounds like that. Like, like just this year, um, in at, at Cabot, I think, uh, a judge voted me down because he said I talk too fast. And so it, there are going to be judges that think you speak too quickly, even if you know you're in that sweet spot. There are going to be judges that think you speak too slowly, even if you have a good speed. And so what's important is to, again, remember that in the vast majority of times, as long as you're in that sweet spot, you're okay. But if critiques keep coming up, and if they keep telling you that you speak too quickly or speak too slowly, then it's important to adjust your speaking cadence, your speaking style. And in terms of this like one specific situation here, there are gonna be rounds where your opponents has a lot of arguments against you and you're gonna feel like you really, really need to speed up to address them all. But you need to remember that judges will prefer arguments that are well explained and well warranted pretty much every single time. Like if an opponent, especially in PF, is just reading answers like that, like one after the other after the other, then it's probably going to be that they've glossed over the explanations. They're not backed up. They're not backed up by evidence. They're not well warranted or well explained. And so judges are going to prefer arguments and evidence that is well explained to them. That ex that is explains why that evidence or that argument matters in the rounds. What the impact of that evidence is. What uh, what the impact of that argument is and stuff like that. And so even if you think that you really really need need to speed up to get through everything, remember to Slow down, remember to explain your points, remember to explain what you're thinking, remember to be clear and concise. And then we have volume. And this is something that I've really struggled with. The first point here is that volume does not equal passion. In my novice year, I was a huge, like I almost yelled basically when I was speaking. It was not good. I've, I'm sure it's kind of legendary among DHS and BWHS debaters how loud I talked. But like people would, people would say that they could hear me like through the classroom walls if they were debating next to me. And so in my novice year, I was like, yeah, great. I'm going to keep doing that because I was like, okay, if I speak loudly, if I speak really loudly, then my judge is going to understand how passionate I am about the topic. My judge is going to think that I'm confident, that I'm a powerful speaker, and that my arguments matter more than my opponents. But the thing is, that's not how it works. In, nov in my novice year, that worked pretty okay, because as long as you're like semi-confident in novice year, you're going to do okay. But as I got into JV and varsity, people were like, why are you talking so loud? And why are you talking so loud throughout your entire speech? Because even if you're really passionate, it's going to lose its impact if you're, if you're passionate about everything. If you're passionate about everything, you're passionate about nothing. Because if you keep that same level of passion, then the judge is going to be numb to it. And the judge isn't going to care about when you really need to be passionate and the things that you really need to be passionate about. And so you need to almost be theatrical with your volume. And you need to try to think about debate, not just as reading arguments one after the other and like gaming the system to make the judge think that you're a good speaker, but you also need to think about being a performer. Because think about like when actors, for example, like lower their voice uh, in front before like a really impactful scene, before a really impactful line. That's something that you kind of need to take into account. And that's something that I've tried to do in terms of my variation in my volume, because it makes it all the more impactful if you're speaking at a normal tone and then you like explode. Well, not necessarily explode, but you get more passionate, you get more, you get louder, uh, you slow down. And if, you, or if you're able to vary your volume and your speed and then become passionate on the things that really matters, the things that really matter, like on your impacts, like on arguments that you know are rock solid, 
then it's going to stick in the judge's mind all the better. As opposed to if you're just speaking passionately throughout the entire speech, it's going to become abrasive to the judge. They're going to start, they're going to stop paying attention and they're not going to take into account the things that you're trying to be passionate about because you're passionate about everything. And again, embrace your style. You can talk loudly, you can talk softly. As long as you're in that sweet spot, it's pretty okay. But as long as you know how to infuse your voice with passion, and as long as you're able to vary your volume uh, to a degree to make it so that it's not abrasive or disinteresting to the judge, then you're gonna be a good speaker. Okay, moving on to tone. And this is very similar to volume and speed in that it needs to be varied based on what you're talking about. So there are two basic tones that you can use in a debate. The first is conversational. And basically what you're gonna wanna do, or at least what I've found to be somewhat successful is that be more conversational when you're explaining things to the judge, which is like on your links or talking about why an argument matters in the round. Because then it makes a lot more impact to the judge if you're able to have a conversational tone and you're not just preaching to them. If you're explaining, explaining the argument to them, the link to them, sort of as if you're their peer, sort of as if you're seeing uh, like on eye to eye, as opposed to you being like on a podium somewhere, like giving this grand speech about the impact of your contentions. And so it's really, really important to be conversational, Try to keep it professional. Don't act too uptight or formal when going through a claim, a warrant, or trying to explain something to the judge. And this is a hard thing to master, uh, no doubt, but if you get it down and if you're able to switch between a conversational and a professional and passionate tone, then it's going to be really, really impactful. Like um, last year, uh, this one debater that I went against um, at, uh, I forget what tournament, but his name is Jace Pollard. He's a really, really good debater, like national level. I think he qualified for NAF and PF with his partner. And he gave this super good speech against one of my contentions that was delivered fully in a conversational tone. Like it completely changed the, the course of the round. Uh, the, the, the topic was um, about Venezuela and it was about whether or not the United States should remove sanctions against Venezuela. My argument was that if the United States did remove sanctions against Venezuela, it would be a, um, a sign that they were planning to invade Venezuela. So it was basically kind of trying to think about like the, the United States' own geopolitical goals and stuff like that and taking the removal of sanctions as a sign that intervention was imminent. imminent. But he gave up there in his rebuttal and basically didn't go line by line at all. Just talked about, gave a speech about the slippery slope fallacy. It was delivered in this great conversational tone. Uh, it was like really like down to earth really like he was just explaining like somebody walked up to him on the street and asked him to explain what a slippery slope fallacy was and he went through all of my points talked about how um uh the removal of sanctions leading to like this gigantic war in venezuela was a slippery slope fallacy which like afterwards i realized that it kind of was and so it's can be really impactful and really good for you if you can use a conversational tone but you also need to be professional and passionate in your speaking uh and this this can be essentially like when you're talking about your impact are really important facts and figures that you have in your speech that you know the judge really needs to take down. And so you need to get almost angrier, almost more passionate when you're addressing impacts. And because if you're conversational on your impacts, the judge doesn't really get the importance of those. Like it's a lot different if you're just speaking and you say, okay, 7 million people are gonna die because of this. Whereas if you say 7 million people are gonna die because of this. Like, so it's really sticks in the judge's head if you slow down and make sure that they get it. And if you're more professional and passionate on those impacts and on the rhetoric that you know is going to win you the round and the rhetoric that you know the judge is going to pay attention to. And so it can even be okay to use sarcasm and irony if it's done politely enough. Like obviously, as soon as you do that, it's important to get back to the facts of the case to avoid being condescending. But as soon as, but you can do things like, for example, using the September on October topic. I think I mentioned this before, like charter schools are beneficial to U.S. education. And if somebody's running an impact that says, or an argument, that says that the existence of charter schools is the sole reason for global warming in the United States or global warming worldwide. And you can say our opponent argues that like charter schools are the only reason why the ice caps are melting, why millions of tons of CO2 are being pumped into the air every day, uh, why the polar ice caps are melting across the world. And then you can say like that just doesn't make much sense. And so if you deliver that in a bit of a sarcastic tone, then it can be all the more impactful for the judge and they really get what you're saying. But it's also important to just immediately after you do that, get back to the facts of the case, uh, get back to the arguments and try not and try to avoid being condescending or being rude. Okay, and then we have clarity and enunciation. And so the majority of being a clear speaker whose words can be understood comes before the round. 
if you understand your arguments, your evidence, and your blocks, which is essentially our evidence or arguments that you've prepared against potential opposition arguments, there's a good chance we'll speak with clarity. And so it just comes from an understanding of what you're arguing in the rounds. If you have an in-depth understanding of the ideas that you want to talk about to the judge and why your impacts matter in the rounds, why your arguments are really likely to happen, then you'll be able to give a clear and concise explanation to the judge as to why your impacts really matter, as to why your arguments really matter. But if you don't have an understanding, if you just have a general understanding of what's going on, you don't really have an in-depth understanding, then you're not going to be able to give a clear and concise explanation or something. You're just going to be going over and over on the same few sentences, and you're not going to be able to really explain it or make it click in the judge's head. And then again, you need to enunciate. So if you're speaking, just try to remember, don't try not to slur your words, try to slow down and make sure that the judge hears everything that you're saying. This comes a lot with practice, practice with yourself in the mirror, practice in practice rounds, practice in front of varsity members, practice in front of your parents. Do anything that you can to make sure that you're clear, that you enunciate. And obviously you can't eliminate like verbal fillers and stutters. Like it's impossible to just not do that anymore, but you can minimize them 